Wanting a world championship is one thing, getting it is another. Coach Alex Hannum explains the route to the playoffs. I think that we achieved something in our win-loss record over regular season play that will never be equaled again. Uh, losing only 13 uh, games in a long NBA schedule is something that uh, I believe will be virtually impossible for any team to do again. The thing that uh, made this team so great, I think, was a natural maturing of the whole team together. We remember that uh, I coached uh, some of these players up in Syracuse. I coached against Wilt Chamberlain when he was down here in Philadelphia with the old Warriors. I coached Wilt Chamberlain out in San Francisco. Uh, now I had the opportunity, when all of these players are back together again, maturing together, getting better year by year. And, uh, and so I sum it up by saying that it's the natural maturing of this talent sometimes overlooked the management. On the left, general manager Jack Ramsey. On the right, President Irv Kozlov, sole owner after the death of Ike Richmond. Much comment has been made on the change in Chamberlain's style. From loner to an integral part of a five-man team is quite a jump, even for Wilt. Alex Hannum. This year, I was fortunate to uh, take over a team that had the talent that uh, allowed Wilt to play the style of ball he did this year. It was not necessary for him to score uh, in order to win. It wasn't necessary for him to carry the whole load offensively. Uh, he had the type of talent to play with, and uh, this gave uh, me all kinds of weapons. But the weapon the fans still love most is the stuff. Wilt style. Coach Hannum analyzes the rest of his team. Hal Greer, I think, is one of the three best middle distance jump shooters in the history of the game of basketball. Hal can hit that middle distance jumper. He gives us offense at all times. Had, I believe, his greatest year this year. Luke Jackson, I believe, is capable of playing a great center position, but when you're playing on the same team with Wilt Chamberlain, you've got to adapt yourself to playing that forward position, which is exactly what Luke did. We had the most powerful, awesome side as far as rebounding and strength on the front line of any team in the history of professional basketball. Wally Jones, there were some question marks about Wally before the season started, but it didn't take him long to dispel any doubts about his being a great pro basketball player. When the blue chips were in the pot, he hit, and he hit consistently. Chet Walker, his great shooting, his great driving, his great defense, one of the truly great all-around ball players and corner men in this game. Billy Cunningham has been known as instant offense. He became the 76ers' sixth man. He comes in cold, and he just tears the other team apart. When he's scoring and driving to the basket, which is his game, he, the name, the kangaroo kid, really tells the story because this is exactly what he is, and he gives us that offensive punch that we need so many times to get us going when things get a little bit dull. Matty Gukas, in his first year as a pro, was of a question mark early in the year, but arrived much sooner than most of us thought he would. As to his own contribution to the team? Well, I would like to think that I had something to do with putting the whole thing together. And putting the whole thing together took the 76ers to the semifinals with the Cincinnati Royals in a best of five series. For the first game in Philadelphia, everything looked rosy. Hal Greer used his own inimitable style to pop the ball in the basket. But Cincinnati's Oscar Robertson drew the Royals ahead. Philadelphia came back with Luke Jackson tying the score. Nobody figured on Connie Dirkin getting hot, but he did. The Royals led at halftime, and they continue to lead. Wally Jones starts to come through. But it's not enough against Dirking on the outside and Oscar Robertson on the inside. Wilt has a great night with a total of 41 points, but it's not enough against Dirking's 29 and Robertson's 28. The Cincinnati series is the first step on the road to the ultimate championship, and it starts dimly. In the second game, another stroke of misfortune sidelined the 76ers veteran guard, Larry Costello. Costello had to miss the rest of the playoffs with a bad knee. 
But then Philadelphia became inspired. Wilt. Chet Walker. Al Greer. Chamberlain to a wide open Walker. The 76ers went on to trounce the Cincinnati Royals three games to one, and the first obstacle was overcome. Oscar Robertson was left talking to himself. But through it all, Alex Hannum had something else on his mind. The Boston Celtics. They had Cousy, they had our back before him. But they didn't have the world championship until they got Bill Russell, and now he's the player coach. In the past 10 years, the Boston Celtics have won nine out of 10 world championships. Last year, the 76ers were the almost team of the NBA. But the Celts ended the great dream in the Eastern Division playoff. Philadelphia lost the final game by one point. The past cries out, beat Boston. The first game at the Palestra. Boston takes the lead. But the team that controls the backboards controls the game. Chamberlain. And then Greer. The 76ers take the lead. No man's land. Cunningham. And Philadelphia holds the lead. To ensure the lead, Wilt goes wild. Nothing gets by him. Off an inch, and Chamberlain's there. And so is Greer, scoring. And scoring. Boston is not dead. Russell. But Philadelphia does not let up. Luke Jackson. And Wilt under the boards to Greer. Chamberlain. At halftime, the 76ers lead by 17. And Greer is still hot. Cunningham to Chamberlain. A fake on Russell. He's in. Wally Jones from the side. Chet to Wilt. Russell tries to drive by Chamberlain. But the game is already gone for the Celtics. The 76ers win by a 14-point margin with Hal Greer high man, 39 points. After a narrow win in Boston, the 76ers are back in Philadelphia at Convention Hall. Alex cautions the team about overconfidence. With management looking on, a seesaw battle rages on the court. Neither team can break open the game. Wilt manages 25 rebounds in the first half, but Philadelphia only leads by two at halftime. Boston is not dead. But with the big man under the boards, a miscalculation can turn into a scoring opportunity. However, the tenor of the game still has not changed. Both teams struggle. Neither can establish a clear lead. And the lead changes many times. But Wilkes' domination under the board starts to pay off. A length of the court pass to Cunningham. And the mood changes. Greer, driving, shooting. Scoring. In the final seconds, Wilt is fouled by Casey Jones. Although not the greatest foul shooter, Wilt can make them when there is something at stake. Today, it's only the last two points in the game. The end of a perfect day with a record 41 rebounds to his credit. 
With three games locked up, the great dream of a four-game sweep over the Celtics seems a short step across the street to Boston. Boston is not dead, says a cornered Bill Russell. In his first year as player coach in the National Basketball Association, Russell inherited a solid organization, but it's leaking. Three games down, the old veteran looks to a loyal Boston following to recharge his team's draining spirit. And the fans come through. Excitement in Boston is at fever pitch. Players become targets for raw eggs, and Coach Hannum receives a friendly death threat. But through it all, Luke Jackson responds to spark the 76ers. The 6'9", 240-pounder leads the team with 29 points. But the great dream of the four-game sweep is slipping away. Still, the 76ers have what it takes to come back. Flashes of brilliance from Chet Walker, and the team from Philadelphia starts a comeback. It's late in the fourth period, and the Celtics have only a one-point lead. A bad pass. Wilt to Gukas. The 76ers lead by one. A bad shot. Wilt rebound. To Walker. To Greer. To Gukas. The 76ers by three. But Boston is not dead. Havlicek. To Russell. The Celtics gain momentum. The defending champs edge to a one-point advantage with only 25 seconds left on the clock. Sam Jones around Matty Gukas. Only seconds left. Philadelphia has to stop Boston. Best of seven. Four in a row. The great dream. Don't let them shoot. Boston is not dead. Jones. Gukas stops him. Fan joins the melee. Break it up. The game's over. Boston is not dead. We all were very, very disappointed. We wanted to establish our superiority over the Boston Celtics. Uh, we would have liked to have done it right there in Boston. And we felt very, very sad, but uh, very, very determined about what we would have to do when we got that team back down in Philadelphia. The thought that runs through the 76ers' minds before game five. If we don't do it now, it's back to Boston. Irv Kozlov expresses his concern. Last year, I predicted four in a row. Not only did we not win four in a row, we didn't win it at all. A sign put up early in the season by a well-wisher haunts Alex as he paces the locker room. The fans all want number four, the winning number in the best of seven series, now. A capacity crowd of over 14,000 is here, hoping for the kill for the revenge, for the sweet feeling. Along with General Manager Jack Ramsey and President Irv Kozlov is Pennsylvania's Governor Raymond Schaefer. The opening jump. Havlicek. Wilt. Now things look better. But Boston maintains a healthy lead. Sam Jones. Wilt scores 22 in the first half, but it's not enough. Russell relaxes with a comfortable margin. Boston is not dead. Philadelphia faces a 16-point disadvantage, but keeps fighting. Chet Walker. Greer. But the 76ers are down 65 to 70 at halftime. Then Wally Jones gets hot. The 76ers trail by one point. They have not held the lead yet in this game. Wilt. Wally. Chet. Wally. The 76ers take the lead. Wally Jones tells of the crowd's effect on the team. Crowd shouting and everything. The, the momentum of the team started to move then, and we just, we just knew that we had them then as soon as we got ahead. Then Luke Jackson.
And then Wally Jones. Then Wally again. And again. Jones hits eight out of nine and breaks Boston's back. Wally describes how it felt. As soon as I hit my first shot, and I felt quite confident, and I just felt the streak come on. And every time I had the ball, I felt so confident that I just continued to shoot. Then the roof starts to cave in. Billy Cunningham. Greer. Under the boards, the famous Russell Chamberlain duel reaches a settlement. Al Greer. Matty Gukas. Again. Bill Russell watches a dynasty crumble around him. The final second. final score. This is how it felt. Early in the year, I decided uh, to give our 76er team a chance to cool off for just a couple of minutes up in the dressing room before we allowed the press to come in. The tremendous feeling you have of coming back to that room with your own group, and looking at one another and knowing that you have done it. This moment was truly a moment of elation and tremendous pride. Uh, the real big celebrating, the yelling and screaming came later with uh, the reporters and the fans, but that moment, walking back to that dressing room, is one that I'll never forget. Soon the christening began. It was the biggest night in Chamberlain's career. Just ask Wilt how it felt. Actually, very, very tired. It's a long, long climb, so to speak, because you never can tell when the Celtics are dead. It's always good that you know they're finally out of the way. I really feel as though that this was the greatest Celtics team, so uh, in being this team, I think it helped to make up a little bit for the other losses that we had over the years. Chet Walker. It was something that all of the 76ers had been looking forward to a long time, and it finally happened. I had been in the league six years, and I'd been chasing Boston for, for all those six years. Billy Cunningham. This was the greatest thrill in my life to beat Boston four out of five. Jack Ramsey. We thought we were going to do it, and nothing could stand in our way. Good direction from the coach. I think that's what it takes to become a champion, and this team had it. It had the, the skill, had the willingness of the players to blend their talents into a, a strong, cohesive force and it had the proper direction at the top from the coach. This was something that we had, we and the Philadelphia fans had been looking for uh, for all of these years, the chance to dethrone that team. We had really destroyed a dynasty, and we did not only defeat a great basketball team, but we destroyed a tradition. Irv Kozlov describes his first dousing. I was called to be turning aside and from three or four sides, bottles of champagne poured all over my head, all over my suit, all over my clothes, and finally ran down into my shoes. I emptied one shoe, and actually champagne poured out of the shoe. <laughs> the suit I put aside when I got home and didn't have it cleaned for about a month, but I just enjoyed that wine, fermented odor, and uh, it just carried me back to that night, many nights thereafter. But to become world champions, you must beat the Western Division winner, the San Francisco Warriors. It's that simple. But there are two giant complications. A 6'11 center named Nate Thurmond. 
and a superstar shooter named Rick Barry. Coach Alex Hannum gives a capsule description of these two problems. Rick Barry, in my opinion, is one of the most outstanding, exciting young ball players to come along in many years. Rick has the ability to put the ball in the basket. He, coupled with fellows that can play the defense and get the ball for him, puts together the type of combination that is going to win championship. Nate Thurman is a center that is starting to rival both Chamberlain and Russell as far as his ability, offensively and defensively. And we have found that you don't win big in the NBA unless you have that really great center. With Thurman rivaling Chamberlain under the boards and Rick Barry hitting from all over, the Western Division champs fought the 76ers to a three and two count. The place, San Francisco. The time, late in the third quarter of a game that's been perspiringly close all the way. A scoring battle in the first quarter set an NBA playoff record. But now the Warriors have pulled ahead. Rookie Matt Gukas has been inspiring, but Rick Barry and Nate Thurman have been sensational. Billy Cunningham explains why the top scorer in the playoffs is so hard to stop. I attempted to guard Rick Barry, but he is by far the toughest forward in the NBA to guard because he is in constant movement. Watch out, Bill. Gee. So close and yet so far away. Three in the bag. All you need is one more. Tension, tension, tension. Now it looked again like we were going to let something slip away from us and we were going to have to take it back to Philadelphia. Late, late, very late in the fourth quarter, the 76ers finally lead by one, 114 to 113. But there's always Rick Barry to pull the Warriors ahead. San Francisco leads. Chamberlain is fouled. Ex-Celtic Bill Sharman, now the Warrior coach, relaxes, knowing Wilt's weakness on the foul line. But it's clutch time now. The 76ers take the lead by one, but can they hold it? Luke Jackson is fouled under the basket. Luke shoots, misses. Chamberlain grabs the rebound. The 76ers have the lead and hold it by one until 15 seconds are left. Barry has the ball. Walker guarding. I got a lot of help from Chamberlain, and between both of us, we managed to stop him. And we managed to force him into a bad shot. Luke Jackson got the rebound, and I think that was the turning point of the game. San Francisco substitutes Tom Lachery for Jim King for the jump ball with Luke Jackson. The Warriors gain four inches on the exchange. Chet Walker gets the tap and is fouled. Chet makes the last two points, and the Philadelphia 76ers now have a crown. Chet. We play so many games during one season, and, and right away we just another win. But then the next day, it really uh, came down on me. And I realized for the first time that we were the world champion. And it was just nothing in the world could compare with the way I felt at the time. Jack Ramsey. It's not easily done. It's a rigorous schedule. The playoffs are hard fought. And the best team does win this. And we were the best team, and we won it. Alex Hannum. Uh, we knew we could do it. We knew we wanted to do it. We felt that this was the year that we were going to do it. Chet sums it up. And we did it the hard way. We did it on the road. It's a great thing to be world champs because you're not only the best basketball team in the United States, you are the best basketball team in the whole world, and that includes Russia and China and every place. And you really don't uh, feel the impact of the whole thing until you, like some nights you sit around or you lie down in bed and you think about it, and then you realize that you are the best. It's, uh, it's a great feeling, nothing you compare with. A basketball team is more than five men on a floor. It's like an iceberg with men and women and money hiding beneath the surface, behind the team. It's a pretty voice on the phone, cool fingers on a typewriter. Sometimes it's called Connie. Or it's a man in an office responsible for absolutely everything except the team when it's on the floor. It's a job with a definite title but an endless commitment. Sometimes a man called Jack fills that job. Or it's someone who arranges for everything that Jack builds, and she may be called Marcia. Or it's a person in sales named Rich who does everything that has to be done and needs willingness to do it. 
or it's a two-fingered typist named Bob who brings the team to the public, or a trainer named Al who keeps the men on the floor, or it's a man named Mike behind a glass counter who handles all the tickets and has to give everyone a seat in the first row, middle section, or it's an owner who receives awards for having the best basketball team in the world. Sometimes they even call him Kaz. But to the public, a basketball team is the men who excel in their sport and they receive recognition from their hometowns. Sometimes the town is called Philadelphia and has a history of developing great talent like a Wilt and a Matty and a Wally. Sometimes Wally will tell why. Quite a few pros and quite a few tremendous college ball players that come out of Philadelphia. They seem to be bred in here because I think the recreation department has a tremendous program for them and we have the summer league in the whole city of Philadelphia. And now that team has its own home court, and the coach tells how important that is to the team and the fan. Spectrum in Philadelphia will put the Philadelphia sports fan on a par with anyone in this country. And we with the 76ers are really looking forward to having a truly home court advantage where the building is perfect, where every fan can see every bit of action. Inside that building, this is the level of competence you'll see. Got the basket. 